morning, church family. I want to extend a special invitation to each and every one of you, whether this is your first visit or whether you have been a member here for years and years. We're going to have, we, we want to provide every opportunity that we can for us to get to know each other, to make new friends, to learn each other. And we are going to have a special family afternoon, evening, uh, next Sunday, starting at 430 at uh, my home. And uh, we want to invite each of you to be there. There will be plenty of uh, parking. We'll have people help you know where to park and where to go. Uh, we have several who are going to be baptized as well. We'll have some good barbecue. It's going to be a wonderful time together, but we want to encourage you to be there. Listen, there are some uh, in invite cards that are back there in the foyer area uh, at the information center. And if you pick up one of these, it gives the address and information, the times and whatnot, but that's next Sunday. So we want to invite you to be there and uh, we're going to expect you to be there because it's a wonderful time of fellowship and I think that you'd enjoy it. Um, bring your lawn chair and uh, uh, some place to, for some place to sit. And if you're being baptized, you might want to wear some little water shoes or something like that. But we'll have a great time, time uh, together, and I want to encourage you to be there. You know, if, you're, if you've never been baptized, if you perhaps have never asked Christ to come into your life, I read a quote by Charles Spurgeon this past week that said, you know, you can live your life without Jesus, but you better not die without him. And uh, what a profound statement that is. And so the best time to get that taken care of is right now. Let's go ahead and take care of it. We can help you with that at the end of the service today. There will be several pastors here or wherever we are. Track us down, and we'd love to be able to help you with that decision. And if you've never been baptized by immersion, um, ba baptism comes from the Greek word baptism, which means to plunge, to dip, to immerse, to put under the water. If you've never been put under the water, representing the death and resurrection, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we want to invite you to do that. Let's do that together as a church family. But um, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse, really in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, I, I have some great topics that uh, have been assigned to me as we're going through um, the Ephesians uh, series. And then we'll conclude actually next week in Ephesians chapter 6. But let me open in a word of prayer as we, um, as we open God's word. Lord Jesus uh, here in this place today, we want to bow our lives before you. You are sovereign Lord. And uh, we realize at times, so many times in our life, how fragile and dependent we are on you. And there's so much that we don't understand. There's so much that we don't understand about what's going on here in this world and what's going on in uh, the heavenly realm and how we are to participate in that. But I ask, Lord, that as I open your word today, uh, expound on your word, that you would give insight, wisdom, understanding. Um, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd fill me and that you'd speak through me today. I pray that the enemy, uh, any spiritual enemies, any demonic spirit would be banned from this place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, that you'd free our mind to think with your thoughts as your word is distributed today. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as, we, as we've walked through the Ephesians study, there's been kind of a funnel effect where it starts out with the big picture and then it hones down to where it gets really close and personal. And we have to kind of evaluate our lives and, talk, and think about where some changes need to occur. And I want to encourage change uh, to occur in your life as it is in mine as I studied these uh, scripture, scripture passages. But as Christ followers, we have a tremendous responsibility as, um, as the bride of Christ, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that he loves intensely. So though an, a new section begins um, as we start off in, in verse 22, there's a transitional verse that I want to back up to in verse 21 that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, then in we, as we start in, in verse 22 and following, uh, Paul lists three specific areas in the family relationships of a Christian household where submission is the will of God. Now, there are some who have misunderstood submission, and sometimes for some that is a, a sensitive word or a sensitive uh, description, but I want you to hang with me. Don't cut me off. Hang with me until you realize the intention of that word submission and how it applies to our lives and to our families. Um, there are too many places, well, there are, really aren't too many places in the Word of God where 
Uh, we get so much of the detailed instruction of what the family is supposed to look like as in these verses starting in verse 22. But um, let me start in verse 21 and uh, when I have some light to be able to see. But we'll look at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of, uh, with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In verse 28, he says, in this same way, husbands, listen, you ought to love your wives as your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound ministry. Paul says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, I'm going to explain that a little bit so we can really grab that and be able to live it in our life, maybe make some changes, alterations as we need to. But actually, marriage is a physical reflection of a spiritual reality. And that is that there are some things down here on the earth that represent things in the spiritual realm that we can't see, and we can make that application. But it's an earthly illustration of Christ's relationship with his church, the marriage relationship. It's, so it's, it's holy, it's sanctified, it's a beautiful relationship. It's the invention of, of the Lord. Now, this is going to be foreign to anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ because the world is focused on what that person can get out of the marriage what that person get out? Are you meeting my needs? Are you living up to my expectations? Are you the way that I want you to be in this, in this relationship? But couples often break up when the feelings are gone or what they call irreconcilable differences, where, which is really selfishness when you describe it. But they want out of the marriage so they can find somebody else. But in this passage, we get clear direction on God's design for a healthy marriage, reflecting the health of Christ's relationship with this church. So the physical marriage relationship and Christ's relationship with the church are two rails running down the same track. They're both running side by side because one is a physical reflection of a spiritual reality and they're running side by side uh, parallel to each other. Three specific areas in the Christian household where submission is the will of God. Number one, he says wives should submit to their, their own husband out of honor and respect. Secondly, children should submit to their parents. Actually, that goes to a whole other level. It's not just submission, but it's, but it's uh, obedience. A child should obey their parents stepping under. As long as they're under the authority uh, of their parents, they should obey their parents, not just submit. And there's, there's a difference between the two, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then thirdly, slaves are to obey their earthly masters with respect and fear and, and sincerity of heart. Now, of course, we've gotten way past the master and slaves, but I think we can safely make application to the employer and the employee. The fact that all believers are one with Christ doesn't mean that we can ne neglect the various forms of authority and, and government which, which God has put into place. But every well-ordered society rests on two specific pillars or supporting pillars, and that's authority and submission. There has to be, the, there has to be a, uh, a structure to any organization or any family, and the principle is so basic that we find that it's even in the Godhead. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says, Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of, of Christ is God. So the absence of government is anarchy, and no government, no nation can survive living under anarchy, and you know, which is a big concern for our nation. Never before have we seen such defiance to authority. To structure. 
uh, and uh, with, uh, with an unwillingness to submit to one another. A nation divided can't stand. And we see that Jesus said that in, in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. He says, Jesus knew their thoughts and he replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And you see that happening all around us. So obviously the instructions given in this passage are both important and timely as we witness the deterioration of the nuclear family and also the, um, the severe polarization of our nation. The same is true in the home. There must be a head giving leadership and sacrifice and there must be submission. So let's talk about that today. Let's for a few moments, Paul's instructions for unity and success in the family, in the marriage relationship. And there are two big words that would be highlighted, that we'd want to highlight in this passage. And uh, first of all is that of sacrifice. Let me read those Verses again, verse 25 through 28. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water uh, through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, the instructions that he gives to husbands is really all about sacrifice. When you look at this passage, when you look at the, the verses that he lays out, the husband's role is sacrifice. In the Greco-Roman um, uh, world, there was, uh, women were obli had obligations to their husbands, but it wasn't vice versa. And so there's a, a new teaching uh, of Christianity that, that uh, revolutionized the thought of marriage in the family and still applies to us uh, even today. But the New Testament has much to say about the relationship between husbands and wives, but it has more to say really about the husbands than it does the wives. If you look at those verses, you realize that to the ladies, to the wives, there's three verses. To the men, there's seven. Seven, so it's a little bit, a, little, a greater emphasis because we're talking about sacrifice here. And these verses talk about husbands loving their wives in the same way that Christ loves the church, how he gave himself up for the church, and how husbands are to take that same mindset towards their wives, towards their wives, uh, the, in the, to love their wives in the same way that Christ loves the church. Now, men have a responsibility to be kind and good to their wives and treat them as they would treat themselves. You listen to verses 29 through 31 where it says, After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, since marriage involves a union of two people becoming as one flesh, then you would have to say that for a man to love his wife, he's loving himself. He's loving himself in, in return. And I think this all really comes down to men treating their wives in the way that allows their wives to be able to respect them. You know, at the end, the man, uh, the man is going to be responsible for living a life of, uh, that earns respect that earns respect from his spouse, that earns respect from his family. And if a woman is not able to respect her husband, it's very difficult. It's going to be very difficult for her to walk in alignment with him and to follow his leadership in the home. There's a big difference between honor and respect. When you talk about honor, you're talking about a position uh, that someone has. For example, honor your mother and your father. Their days be long upon the earth. Well, some of your mother, some of your mothers or fathers didn't, didn't, uh, didn't earn your respect. And so, but you honor them for the position that they have as your mother and father, but respect has to be earned. Respect has to be earned. It's not a right that we have, but it's a, it's a privilege that we earn and we maintain uh, that respect. In verse 33, Paul says that the wife must respect her husband. The husband has to earn that. He has to earn that respect. We as men have a huge responsibility in the marriage to earn the respect of our wives. Does she respect the person that you have become? Does she respect you for your love and your obvious commitment to her without having suspicion or doubt uh, or, or, or fear about uh, or be, uh, being insecure about your commitment and your love for her? 
Does she respect the role that you play in providing for the family? Um, Are you holding your own end up? Does she respect the leadership that you provide for the family or has she had to insert herself there to give leadership to the family because you won't? Does she respect your walk with the Lord? Another big word that we talked about, we talked about sacrifice, but now we want to talk about submission. And again, we start back in verse 21 where it says, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for, for, for Christ. Before wives are even mentioned, you can see that all of us are to practice a mutual submission to one another. Um, Submission never implies inferiority. Submission is alignment with one another. Submission is one equal voluntarily submitting to the authority and position of another equal in in order that God would be glorified and that there would be unity. Submission is the view of your value, placing more value on the other person than you place on yourself. Submission means to arrange under rank. And really, it is a military term. If there's a general and a private, it doesn't mean that one is, a, is better than the other. It just means that one has a position of authority, has been given a position of authority, and the other must submit to that position of authority. So that word submission has, been, has really taken a bum rap in the days in which we're living today um, and, and uh, inferring that one is weaker or less important than the other, and that's totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. But uh, let's take a look at the role of the wife in the marriage as he explains it. In verse, beginning of verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now note, you are following, falling into rank for the Lord's sake, for unity, for structure. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which, uh, the church his body, which, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives must submit to their husbands in everything. Uh, submission never implies inferiority. Um, the Lord, Lord Jesus is submissive to God the Father, and he certainly is not inferior uh, to God the Father. Neither is the woman inferior to the man. In many cases, she is superior. In many instances, she is superior to the man. But before your guard gets up, let me tell you what that word submission actually means. It means, in this instance, it means to align with. You're aligning with this person. You're aligning. So you're both moving in the same, same direction. We submit to one another, but one has been assigned to take the lead. And it's the um, great um, preacher of old, uh, Adrian Rogers of the great Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, um, he once said, anything without a head is dead, and anything with two heads is a monster. You see that in churches where there is a fighting for leadership in the church and it splits right down the center and divides the people. You see that in families, in marriages, where there is, where there is uh, two people vying for that leadership position and that marriage is not going to be able to survive. Now, I will say that there are many men who will not step up and assume their leadership role in the home, and therefore they're winning on everybody playing their role in such a way that it benefits the whole, it benefits the entire, the entire unit, and there's a huge ripple effect if someone steps out of their role of the way that God has intended for that marriage relationship to be. Someone steps out of that role, then there is a ripple effect that affects everybody in that, in that family and, and around them. Now, if you look at the alignment that we talked about earlier, then the woman is, um, only, the wo- the woman is only able to play her role in submission if the husband is loving her as Christ loves the church. And he's given sacrificially to her, putting her well-being Um, above himself. Now, there is a a passage in uh, Genesis where during creation where God created man and then he created woman. Um, And he uses the word helper here in Genesis chapter 2. I think we can pull that up 
on the screen, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. He created man. He gave him dominion over the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and he gave him dominion over everything. He was to be in charge, but then he realized, you know, man was lonely. It's the first dilemma of mankind. Man was lonely, and so God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, that word helper, what does that mean? Well, I listened to a clip from a sermon this week um, by Dr. Robert Jeffries of First Baptist Church of Dallas. He said this so beautiful. And really, this, this, if you'll listen carefully to this, it may change the way you look at your marriage. It may change the way some of us think about uh, what God has given as a, as a spouse. But he says here, the true meaning of wives being a helper to the husband. The woman is described, if you don't mind me just reading this, I don't want to miss anything. The woman is described as being man's helper, the one that is to help the man achieve his God-given purpose in life. Now, I know that sounds like it's derogatory, a derogatory view of women, that women are nothing more than a helper to their husbands. But... The Hebrew word translated helper is used 21 times in the Hebrew Old Testament and 15 of those 21 times it refers to God himself. God is man's helper. The Lord is my helper. And that's the word that's used here. So he says man is deficient by himself. He's weak by himself. He needs a helper. He needs God, but God's provision to help him is the woman, bringing the woman into his life. The woman is the God figure in the husband's life. Not that she would become God, but she is is the enabler that God sends to assist him, to walk beside him, to lift him up. To, uh, uh, the woman is the God figure in a husband's life. She's the one who makes up for the weak parts and deficiencies. Is that beautiful or what? So as a man, God says, it's not good that you're alone. And so the presence of God, it comes to help that man by sending the woman, by bringing the woman into uh, his life. I just think that's such a beautiful, and it could really transform the way you look at your wife. The way you look at your, at, at your life, this combination, this reflection of a spiritual reality. So I'm sad to say, though, that in our society today, a, a majority of homes are dysfunctional. The divorce rate in the church is the same as it is out there in the world. Debbie and I ha- celebrated a while back our 35th wedding anniversary, and uh, the waiter came up, a young guy, and um, he said, wow, 35 years, that's unusual these days. He said, my parents broke up when I was eight years old. You know, that's very common. Many of you have experienced uh, broken marriages. Many of you have experienced broken families, broken homes. A lot of marriages are falling apart because, because both are not fulfilling their roles. It takes both. It takes both. And if you wonder why there's such tension in your marriage, maybe just check yourself and I'd have to say that I'm looking at myself as I'm preparing this message for you and thinking, what role am I playing? Am I playing the proper role in the life of my family? I want to be all that God wants me to be and my, that my family needs me to be. What do you think is going to happen if the man and the woman are both fighting for the leadership position or one of the two just totally abandons their role? Here's a good illustration of submission. A good example of true submission would be the organs in the body. They are submissive to one another. They are in alignment for the sake of the body's proper function. In any organization, there is structure so that it can function properly. Again, Adrian Rogers quote, anything without a head is dead. Anything with two heads is a monster. What if I came to you one Sunday morning, and I said, the human resources team of our church has decided that uh, there, is no, uh, there is no leader in the church, that all the staff have equal, um, equal uh, leadership authority. What do you think would happen to the church 
it may be okay for just a little while, but eventually there's going to be a crack down, down the center, down to the foundation of the church. Just, we're all wanting to move in different directions. What, about, what would that be in your working environment? Um, and uh, if there was no declared head and everyone was vying for that position, there would be chaos and disunity in that organization. Well, I see that frequently in some families that, that I, I know, and they're, they're, there's constant friction in those families. Another malfunction that I see in a lot of families today is the role of the children. Uh, there's, there should always be a subservient role in the family, but I see uh, for some that role, um, there are children that rule the roost. They're in control. Everything rotates around the children and what that child wants rather than the dad giving leadership to the family, the kids do. And that is a very serious malfunction in any family for the father not to step up and give leadership. Do you want to play sports or do you want to go to church? Do you want to worship the Lord and honor his day or do you want to do something else and go to the lake and go ski? And periodically, I would say that's okay, but what are the priorities that you're setting in your children's lives as a father? Is the child deciding what they're going to do and what direction they're going to do or is is the father deciding that or giving leadership to the family? Um, Listen to Paul's instructions in chapter 6, verses 1 and 4, where he says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for for this is right. And obedience means to, according to the dictionary, to comply with or follow the commands, restrictions, wishes, or instructions. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, and that that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So I would say that obey is the key word there, which falls right in line with giving honor. And this is much different from the relationship between the husband and wife. The wife is to be submissive or align herself with the husband while the children are to be obedient, placing themselves under the direction and the authority of the parent. Now, no child or wife should be expected to be obedient or submissive if they are required to compromise the Lord's standard and their commitment to the Lord. Maybe you ask, what if my husband wants me to do something that I know would be contrary or grievous to the Lord's standard? What should I do? Well, absolutely not. Your primary loyalty, your supreme loyalty is to the Lord. And you're, you, you, with that loyalty, you're not going to compromise his standard in order to, it just means that the husband has stepped out of his role. Just means that he stepped outside of his responsibilities. Dads, listen, you're, yours is the greater sacrifice and responsibility in the home. You are to head up the wife and the family as Christ heads up the church. You are to love your wife as you love your own self. You are to love your wife just as Christ loves the church. You are to be united to your wife, declaring that she is your supreme loyalty to be, uh, uh, your supreme loyalty is to be her above any other human relationship. That includes your children or your parents. Your supreme loyalty is to your spouse. You're not to drive your children to rebellion, but Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Respect is earned while honor is given. So God has a huge expectation of us as husbands and dads, and it's, it's a life of sacrifice, placing the importance of others above yourself. Now, a word to a single parent. This, doesn't, this, this ideal doesn't work for you, obviously, and that's a pretty tough deal for you, but... The, this ideal function of the family u- unit is not going to be there for you. So, so you're going to have to lean heavily on the Lord, asking him to give you strength, a supernatural strength, strength and fill in those gaps that are missing because there's not a, another spouse in, in that picture. The strength that you need can come only by the Lord. And uh, going back to the quote I brought from Robert Jeffers, He's your helper. He's your helpmate. He fills that gap 
in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in, in, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Now, here's the mystery. Here's the mystery that Paul sums it up. And we have, when we, when we understand the mystery, then we understand, then we begin to understand our, the, our heightened responsibility that we play these roles because of what it means, because of what it reflects. Here's the mystery, verse 32. This is the profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. So marriage is a physical reflection of a spiritual reality. The relationship between Christ and the church. Jesus' life was a life of submission, and he was in alignment with the Father with the purpose of blessing the church as a holy, blameless bride to rule and reign with him throughout all eternity. So as a man, a husband, my job is to love my wife as a reflection of the love that Christ has for his church. That should be a challenge to most of us. As a woman, a wife is to fill the, fulfill the role as your husband strives to fulfill his and present yourself as a living reflection of the bride of Christ, holy, clean, and radiant. The marriage relationship thus finds itself in the foreshadowing of a relationship with Christ. So it's no wonder that the lost world seeks to dismantle and downplay the sanctity of marriage. As if it's, as if it's optional or if it's ad, abnormal or that they can redefine it, that's a mockery unto the Lord. This is his deal. This is the reflection that he set into place as a result of what is coming to pass. Christ and his church, the bride and the bridegroom coming to pass. Listen, here's marriage. You know, what, what we've been assigned by God as the most important institution this side of heaven, let no person dismantle or disgrace. Here's marriage. Marriage, the definition of marriage is one biological man and one biological woman committed to each other for a lifetime. That commitment that they make to each other can be broken honorably in the sight of God only as a result of one of their deaths. Is there tension in your home? Is there tension in your marriage? And I realize that as I'm talking to this crowd, uh, uh, there are, there are marriages maybe that are on the rocks. There may be some couples here that don't even like each other. There may be some couples that are just madly in love with each other. The romance is still alive. You keep it alive. Whatever the situation is, if there's, if there's an abnormality in your marriage relationship, look at yourself first. Look at yourself first. Do I have blind spots? Is there, something, if there, is there something out of place in my life? Is, do I look at my wife as God's presence, God's provision to me fulfilling my purpose and me enabling her to be all that she wants to be, needs to be, to fulfill the purpose that God has for her. My responsibility is her security for me to help her to know that she is loved and admired and desired. Her responsibility is to show me respect and to love me and to lift me up and to walk beside me and to enable me on life's journey. It's a it's a companionship that is made in heaven. Did you marry the right one? Uh, if you married her or you married him, that's where you are. That's where you are. You let God fulfill his role through your life. And you see what he does in the end. Do you see your wife as God's help to you? Do you see your husband with respect? Respect is earned, man. Respect is earned. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. And, and um, I love it 
Father, when I study your word and it's a challenge to me, and I look in the mirror and I see areas in my own life that need to be adjusted, and we've, sometimes we're just set in our ways and we need a wake-up call, aha moment. And Maybe that has been the case for some here today as we've talked through your word. Lord, I pray that you would lift us all to higher heights. No matter where we are, there may be some here who don't know you as their Savior and Lord, I pray that you'd pierce the darkness. I pray that you'd pierce them with your love. Open their eyes that they could see their need for you. And Lord, there's some here today perhaps who are docile in their Christian walk and just going through the motions. I pray that you'd light a fire up under them. There's some here today who are on fire for you, and I pray, Father, that you would add gasoline to it, that you would ignite us, that you would cause us to be more than we are, that you would change us, that you would enable us to live that supernatural life and be all that you want us to be as we follow after you and live in this world. Wait for you, Jesus, the bridegroom, to come again.